They're not too happy about that. <coughs> Back again. Back again. I think I just did my third trip. Back to the old hood. And uh, it's getting a little old, man. I could almost recite the BC Ferry's food menu off by heart for anything you want. Also, had, uh, the thought of eating up eating food in the BC Ferries now just makes me want to frickin' cringe. But anyway, I had to go back and get uh, pick up my last hundred, I don't know, hundred bales of hay, maybe. <sighs> Seven hours travel one way. If I was to go non-stop, including the ferry. But I did go on a big, major hike. Oh, it's pretty echoey in here. I'm gonna open up the big door. See if I can fix that up. But, uh, I normally go, what I can do, what I figured I can do with that new GoPro camera that I bought is I can actually uh, go to crazy places and share where I am with the planet and share voices with the camera load the content onto my phone and use the iPhone editor movie editor whatever and I can actually Manage to make it good enough to deliver out to you guys. Well, I forgot the GoPro And then I had my Sony Handycam But the phone will not read the files from that Sony Handycam And then I realized oh, but it'll read from the Canon, but the Canon was here <laughs> at home as well So I was screwed for getting caught up in hearing on sharing voices but I did go on one hell of a frickin' burner hike. I sweat through my three layers and through my jacket to get, I wanted to get to these cameras that I had on this one particular mountain. And I tried a different route, went around the backside, got close as I could with the pickup, and then I just started huffing it. Well, this is the part where you, I just hope to God your camera's still there. It's there. <laughs> just see the string. Check out how subtle the string is on my camera. go and I filmed a cute little guy on the side of the one thing I did manage to film I think it's a pica p-i-c-a I'm pretty sure it is a mountain pica it looked like a, uh, a mouse with no tail and we sat there looking at each other for quite a while so I videotaped him so here he is right here but anyways in the meantime check this little guy out I'm just gonna go up out the garage door and see if I can, might be able to get rid of some of this echo
to try that. Ah, that's a little better. Yeah, that's better for sure. Um, so remember in the past, this whole ride, I've been really concerned about why people absolutely drop each other and stop talking to each other immediately after seeing one of these damn things. And uh, I've known people personally, uh, that old ex-girlfriend of mine from years ago, I shared that story quite a while ago. She was driving with her friend. They're like 19 or 20 and they're driving from Whistler, British Columbia to Edmonton. And by the time they got bef just before Valmont, it's the only place the highway starts to climb up between Clearwater and Valmont. All you people familiar with that highway know exactly what I'm talking. And uh, they're going up there through a whiteout, a full whiteout, and she was doing like two miles an hour and she was just started saying, I can't believe we've been driving right now. And looks over, it's like 10 o'clock and every time looks over and her friend was postured up against the passenger side of the car like this, looking past her face at the driver's side window. Terror around her face and she looked over and this thing's face was this far away from her face. Stooped over, uh, lopping along beside the car looking in at them. I shared that one earlier, and uh, she couldn't believe. She said his teeth were straight, just like ours. She said the look on his face was like it was. She goes, "It's like it was rocking it out, like it was having fun, like it was entertaining itself." Was the look on his face she described? She had zero knowledge of these things, these people, whatever you want to call them, beforehand, and. Uh, she said she then realized she was all the way on the other side of the highway, which would have put her to that drop off on the left. And uh, she's like, oh shit, and then she's going to drive back, and then he faded away out of the lights, and that was it. And then they made it to Valmont, there's a Husky station there, pulled into the Husky station, they went and sat in that coffee shop and didn't say a word to each other <clears throat> the whole time. <clears throat> Excuse me, waited till it was daylight out, and then uh, got in the car and carried on to Edmonton, where she was originally from. Dropped a friend off, last time she saw her, and they never spoke again. Years later, when we met, we talked about this, and then she actually found the girl on social media, messaged her, messaged her did message her back. Met, did message her back. And I think that was one of the first times is when I heard of people absolutely dropping each other after sharing one of these um, terrifying experiences. So as always, took note um, my curiosity of that whenever it comes up here and it comes up all the time and it makes me frustrated. So, um, anyway, we talked about this the last time and sure enough, I got a lot of emails in from people to explain what it may be because remember I said, I said somebody's got to be out there that has a possible uh, explanation for this. Maybe there's possibly even a name for it. And it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out why, really, right? When you think about it, it's terrifying. It's absolutely frickin' terrifying. And people don't want to relive it, obviously. But it still frustrates me. So we had, I'll, we, I'll get this email out right away. It was a reply. It's called a psychologist perspective, all right? Steve, I've been following you for about two or two and a half years now, and I certainly appreciate your videos. I'm sure they have been immensely helpful to many who have had these unwanted and unexpected experiences. I'm a retired professor of psychology, and I think I can offer some insight into why people in groups see these things split up and many times never want to interact with each other again. I hesitated when it came to writing to you because the issue is somewhat complicated, but it deserves an answer, so here we go. There are three areas that interact with one Another, when people see Saturday, these include a fear of the unknown, a sense, of this, a sense of safety or being safe, and a sense of control. The sense of control is probably the most important one, and, if we, and it connects the other two together, as you'll see shortly, if I can explain it adequately. Human's worldview is tied up closely to the idea that we are in control of pretty much everything. We are the masters of our own destiny. We control who we are, how we interact with others, and how we function in our environment. We are, the, we are the apex predator on Earth, we think, because of our intelligence. We may not have the teeth or claws of a bear, but we have used our brains to develop firearms to extend our dominance over virtually every other species on the planet. And anything we can't control, 
we can turn it over to our government, which is capable of handling anything we can't do on our own. We know everything that is worth knowing, and anything that we don't know doesn't matter. Arrogant, isn't it? But it is how we have been taught, and many have adop adopted this position as fact. We are safe in the woods and in our homes because we have made ourselves safe. Then, someone or some group of people have an encounter with one or more savvy, and in an instant, the whole house of cards collapses. In an instant, we realize that we are, that, sorry, in an instant we realize that there is a whole area of reality out there that we know absolutely nothing about, and we have no way to become informed of this area. Fear of the unknown is terrifying, but only as long as it is unknown. We have been taught all our lives that Sabe does not exist, and when we realize in a single instant that it does, it brings up the question of what other unknown entities may be out there waiting for us. Fortunately, your website has done a lot to minimize this because we now have a great deal of information about this one aspect of the unknown. Thanks to all of the people. The moment we encounter Sad Bay, our sense of safety also goes down the tubes. Seeing something like this leaves the impression that we are no longer safe anywhere in the woods, probably not in our houses either, because something this large could easily rip the door off its hinges and come in at any time it wanted to. They are so massive that they may refuse to fire, that, that many refuse to fire on them, even if they are armed, because they think it would not have much of an effect. They realize that in an instant that they, they are not safe in either the woods or their homes, and maybe not even in the center of town. And the last most earth-shattering realization is that we are not in control of much of anything. Savvy do not follow any rules or laws but their own. We can't keep them off our property. We can't keep them from attacking us if they want to. We can't understand what motivates them, and we can't go anywhere for help without being treated like we are mentally deficient. There is an aspect of social psychology that comes in here as well. People want to be socially accepted. And if they talk about seeing something that is not supposed to exist, they may be rejected by mainstream society. So, now we come back to the question, why? When groups of people see these things, they sometimes sever connections with others in, a group, in the group and never have anything more to do with them. It's because Every time they think of others in the group, it reminds them all over again that, number one, they are not in control, and that, number two, they are not safe, and number three, they have experienced the unknown and still don't know any more than they did when the experience happened, and four, if their identity is outed by a member of the group, they may become labeled as a nut job by mainstream society and lose friends and possibly their jobs, depending on who they work for. Having said all this, it is important to realize that every person is different from every other person. Some will isolate themselves, but this is not mentally healthy. Your website is a healthy outlet, outlet to, re to relieve some of the stresses associated with these encounters and giving those having the experience to uh, adapt, and ultimately, this is all we can do, adapt. War veterans have more of a problem with savvy encounters than with war because war doesn't include the element of the unknown. They experience fear of death and fear that involves lost control, like being ordered into an active fire zone where it isn't safe, that they have never had to operate under a situation that is completely outside the concept of what should should not exist. A savvy encounter is in a class by itself and bears little resemblance to wartime, except in the root issues causing the problem. I hope this wasn't too long. I'm 76 years old. I live in Dallas, Texas. I no longer live in or near a forested part of the country. But in the past, I've experienced many of the aspects associated with Sad Bay encounters, such as a strong feeling of being watched, being paced on a trail by someone who stays behind and just out of sight, walking when I walk and stopping when I stopped. Strange teepee type structures in the forest, screens, etc. Much of this didn't make any sense when it happened, but it makes a lot more sense now thanks to your website. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. You can use my name. I really don't care what anyone thinks. Sincerely, George D. Boone. George, uh, absolutely appreciate the time you just took to share with the people. And uh, guarantee it's gonna help a lot of us, including me. But I, one question that pops up for me, seeing so you're a professional in psychology department, 
is during your years, I wonder possibly how many times this topic may have come up and did you ever have anybody come in to see you that was traumatized by seeing one of these things? And if you did speak of this topic with your colleagues, what did they think? Was it, was it giggled about? Or did anybody else in your profession take it dead seriously and you guys actually have a, an authentic conversation about it? That's what I would be asking you first right out of the gate. Um, yeah, I've had a, I think, I think there's a whole pile of emails that have come in from people answering the same question, and I did, obviously I saved everyone. I don't know what order they're in, because as I go, when I, as soon as I get, like I'm sitting on the ferry for an hour and 40 minutes, one of my rit rituals is I go into my, excuse me, in my emails, and I copy and paste and save them. I don't really, I don't read them, but there will be, so I'm just saying for all you other people who have written in uh, helpful knowledge to that question of why people gong each other. I just haven't got your email yet and I will and I will read it, all right? Anyway, moving right along. Thanks again for sending that in. And if you want to email me again and answer the questions that I just rifled out yet, I'd be appreciative to receive and share with everybody. Now, moving right along. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a title, Sabe Experiences. <clears throat> Hi, Steve. Eight or ten years ago, I saw Sabe walking straight towards the highway. I was traveling down at 60 miles per hour. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was in southeastern Washington, wheat country, in the wide open, broad daylight. Looked to my right, a grassy swale between harvested wheat fields. He was not huge. Six or seven feet tall, maybe about 50 yards away. Walking towards it, looking right walking towards it and looking right at the highway. I looked right at him for four or five seconds. Then I was past him and he was out of my sight. This is where it gets really weird. I was not a man in a hurry, far from. If I am driving along anywhere and I see something I want to better look at, anything, a flower, a bird, an animal, different geology, something that blew out of someone, someone's vehicle and onto the shoulder, I pull over and walk back for a better look. I just saw a Bigfoot, I prefer the name Sabe, and I didn't even think of pulling over, I just kept going. I felt no fear or foreboding. I do not fear much, and strangely, no need to stop, very strange. A few years after that, I was driving south on Highway 395 through Northeast Oregon, I passed through Pendleton and was heading down to the Burns. I was driving through the last mountain pass before you drive out of the forest. There's a clear, dry road and three foot of snow on the pass. I was driving 40, 45 miles per hour in no hurry at all, taking in the country and watching for critters, tracks, whatever there was to see. You know how we outdoorsmen are. I looked to my left up a bare snow covered cut bank, 50 foot tall and, about, and at about 45 degree pitch. There was a strange line trail of big tracks coming down the road at a bit of an angle from the tree line. Big single tracks, five to six feet apart in a perfectly straight line, no toe drag, no sliding. I knew exactly what made that trail. I was in my 50s. I've been a big game hunter since I was 12 years old and I know how to track and trail and have hunted deer and elk in snow and great, with great joy and success since the 1980s. I'm 63 now and still a hunter. Again, I did not pull over to go back for a longer look. Knew what I was looking at. Did not do what I would ordinarily do. Really strange. I have no answer for why I didn't pull over. After watching your channel for several months, things I've observed in the past come back to me, and I felt like I had found answers to things I'd wondered about, but lost no sleep over. There are other stories, UFOs and other strangeness. Maybe another day. Okay, man. Frank, I absolutely appreciate it. Appreciate it, you setting that in. And um, I could almost sort of relate in a way, well, not, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I, I can feel when things are, are possibly looking at me. I get dozens, dozens of emails from people saying they're right in the forest behind you, behind the counter, check it out, zoom in, zoom in, check it out, check it out, and mark whatever on the video. And I don't, I don't ever. So, you know, I'm not being rude, it's just like, I don't give a shit. I've already seen them. I know they are around. Do I know if one's right behind me or not? I don't know. No big deal. I'm minding my own business. I don't need to know. There probably are. I've had shit thrown at me while 
talking to you guys. What else has happened? Well, enough has happened. Um, one memory that does come up really in your email years ago, I'll never forget. I was actually taking a course to become a certified trapper so I could go after the wolf population explosion in your home. And I was at 100 Mile, Black Lahash or something, British Columbia, middle of winter. Two other guys with me. And we got the course done. We're driving back full on middle winter. And we're driving up and over the Duffy Lake Highway. The Duffy Lake, that frozen ice, is where I shared that wolf kill on the ice recently in a video. Same lake. It's also the same lake where that huge snow slide came down and shot across the lake. Same lake. And we're driving along from the north end. Would it be east end? Northeast end? Heading home south. And uh, we stop and you could plainly see easily from one side of the lake where you saw me controlling the drone to the other side of the lake straight across and you could see the prints bong 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 footprints going all the way along the far side of the lake paralleling the lake shore maybe five ten yards offshore on the ice and you could easily see it was at least a five six foot stride between those prints and they were just trucking all the way down the lake and one guy that was with us was an A-type, A-type personality dude from New Zealand originally. And I'm like, look at that shit. And he's like, well, it must be a heli skier. I'm like, no, it's not a heli skier. The heli skiers, first off, don't ski down from those tops to the lake ice. Otherwise, they'd be parked there all the time and come out all the time. There's no frickin' way. And there's no ski tracks up in the, any of the chutes. And uh, he's just trying to rattle off useless excuses to what it was because it's another person who didn't want to acknowledge it. Meanwhile, it was so blatant obvious, it was stupid. And did I go get a snowmobile and go back and film him? No. Nope. <laughs> did I even videotape him or take a picture? No. Nope. Carried on. Funny, right? Here come the chicken gangsters. Little bastards. Thanks again for sending that in, man. Absolutely appreciate it. All right, here we go. This one is titled, looks like it might be a long one, but all I got is time right now, right? Three day encounter. Ugh. Here we go. Steve, you can use my name. It's Angela. I don't mind you using my name. My sister T was with me, but I didn't get permission to use her name, so we'll call her T. We are registered Native American Indians from the state of Oregon. Registered. I've never heard of that. Registered. I've never heard of that term at all. I hope it's not, uh, I'm not being insulting. I'm not trying to be, but as soon as I hear registered Native American Indians from the state of Oregon, I just feel like saying to the government, yeah, register this, you mother. Here's right. We were raised loggers and daughters. We loved to fish, hunt, camp, and all the out outdoor sports you can think of. We were raised to live off the land. We weren't scared of much. Been chased by a bear, had cougar run-ins, so you can say not much bothers us. This encounter happened September of 76, just a day after Labor Day that year. We were both pregnant at the time. I was nine months pregnant and T two months behind me. We decided to go to one of our old stomping grounds up Canal Creek. We wanted to camp for a few days. We've been going there for years, camping for three months at a time. There while our fathers logged that mountain off. The families would camp in the clearing. The men were made while logging. That day, T and I headed up to, to Canal Creek up Highway 34. We were driving on the sunny day to check out the campsite to make sure it was not full of, with campers. I was driving that day because my sister didn't drive back then. As we were driving up, we came around a corner to a straight stretch and seen someone walking up the road at us in our lane. I slowed to about 40 miles and we realized at the same time it was a creature of some kind. At that time, we didn't even know a Bigfoot. But we both said at the same time, that's not a bear. I almost slowed to a stop. All the while, my sister was freaking out. I had to go into the other lane as to not hit this slow walking creature. It was just ambling up the highway in our lane. We could tell it had just come up from the clam mud across the road because it had gray mud from the beachy area from its knees down, as if it had been digging for clams. We used to dig there ourselves, so we figured that's what it was doing. It ambled off the road to a new house built on the right. We knew the people who built it, and they had large 
stumps in their new yard. They hadn't cleared yet. And big bay windows in front of the house. I pulled off the side of the road and told my sister, we need to let them know the creature in the yard. She said, oh no. We watched the seven foot creature, or taller, walk around a few stumps before going into the woods there by the house. The creature was dark in color from the knees up, dome head, not afraid of us. And it was very large. But after it went into the woods, we just drove on up to our turn to get to the campground. But as the crow flies, the campground is only five miles where we see the creature. When we got to the campground, you could go on either side, one on the Forest Service site, or drive across the creek to the sites where the loggers cleared up a huge field just off the mountain to camp. No one was up there. They had all gone home, so we had the grounds to ourselves. We went back home to our gear. We went back home, got our gear. Plus, our dad was home, so we told him what we saw and he had no idea what it could be. So the next day we headed back up to set up for the few days we planned on camping. Our dad came up to help us set up. I had a 52 GMC pickup truck and dad said he was gonna hang a tarp up so we could pitch our very small pup tents under the tarp. He parked under the tree, climbed the roof of my truck and his six foot frame climbed up the tree and hung our tarp and we were set. After we left, he readied our, he readied our site Cooler on the picnic table full of a loaf of bread, potatoes, eggs, butter, lunch meat, just a few things to eat. We had brought four big heavy cast iron skillets with us. We had set them on the table next to our cooler. We settled in for the night. We didn't cook that night for some reason, but did build a big fire. We sat around the fire till 11 p.m., decided to head to our tents where we had set them up facing each other so we could grab, so we could gab the night away. We listened to the frogs in the stream, the crickets. Then we heard something climb the tree our tarp was tied to. As we were listening, we could tell it was a family of baby raccoons climbing the tree and sliding down our tarp. We figured there were five of them. You could hear them chattering, having fun, sliding down by one by one. They did this for about 45 minutes. My sister and I were enjoying it very much. We talked how cute it was. As we laid there in our own tents listening, we heard silence. We knew there was a predator around. No frogs, no crickets, no raccoons, dead silence. My sister whispered to me, and she heard the silence and whispered back, yes. I was a bit worried because the road before our camp was, I was a bit worried because the road before our camp was to Bear Creek, and yes, they had bears there. I brought along a 22 rifle with me and always slept with it in my sleeping bag every time we camped. Plus, since we were both pregnant, I had parked my truck close to us in it and had it parked to the head out in case one of us went into labor and had to leave quickly. Then all of a sudden, in the silence, we heard something going through our cooler very quietly. No loud, no loud breathing, no smell, no heavy footprints, just something going through the cooler. We know it was walking around. We could hear twigs breaking outside of my tent. Lordy Steve, I got scared and went deep into my sleeping bag, hanging on for dear life to my rifle. But I knew if it had been a bear, we'd have heard more. I don't even think I was breathing at the time, but I knew it was outside my tent. I could just feel it. I whispered to T. I was coming out of my sleeping bag and running to get the truck, and when she heard me pull up to get in, just as I was stepping into the pitch black night, I heard something claw my truck, nails on metal. I stepped back in my tent, hunkered down until daylight. My sister and I laid there listening until about 6 a.m. when the sun came out and we could feel it had gone. We both climbed out to assess the damage. Whatever it was, you could tell it was gone. It had taken our bread out of the cooler. Well, out of the cooler well, all of the contents, Except in the place, sorry. It had taken our bread out of the cooler well, all it must have meant, and all the contents, and set them on the picnic table. The only thing missing was our butter. We looked for prints, but the ground was too hard. We did discover our four heavy cast iron skillets were carried 20 feet from the picnic table and set on the ground. Not knocked off, but picked up and moved. Weird. I was pretty mad we couldn't cook because I was going to use the butter to cook with. We weren't afraid, just mad it took the butter. 
We knew it wasn't a bear or coons. They would have tore into the bread and ate it. Plus, the meats were not disturbed either. Just sat on the table next to the cooler. How bizarre is that? So we didn't live too far, so we put everything back in the cooler, set the cast iron skillets back next to it on the table, and headed back to our parents' house to get butter to cook with. We should have been scared, but we figured the scare was over. Boy, were we wrong. After getting more butter, we headed back to camp again, but when we got there, we got the shock of a lifetime. Our camp was destroyed. The things were taken out of the cooler again, set on the table, cast iron skillets back on the ground in the exact spot, still stacked up. Plus our tents were flattened, not ripped apart. Our chairs folded down on the ground and that tarp hung so high up, and that tarp hung so high up was untied, not torn down, but untied, and over our flattened tents. We looked around from the truck and we both could feel we were being watched from the base of the mountain next to our camp. You could feel the anger. Our sixth sense told us not to stay. This is a very strong warning. I told my sister not to pack anything, just throw it in the back of the truck. Something wants us out of here. She agreed with me, we got the message. On our way back home, my sister T told me the night before she looked out her tent and that thing we spotted the day before on our way up to check the camp, check up the campsite. The creature she said she saw it looking in my, into my tent. I told her, why didn't you tell me? She said she was too scared to tell me, but she watched it looking at me in my tent. Then it went over to the truck. We drove home again and told her father what happened, looked at the claw marks on the roof of my truck, and Dad said it must have been a young bear. T told Dad no it wasn't. It was the thing we'd seen the day before. It was looking into the tent where An Angela was sleeping. Dad just said, well, you guys are lucky then. I so want answers, wanted answers back then as to what we saw. I'd seen Dr. John Bendernagel on TV and a show. I contacted him and told him the whole story. And he assured me it was a Bigfoot encounter. And oh, how did he, and oh, how did he pick my brain for details? Poor soul, a week before he passed, he emailed me again asking if I could remember any more. Nice to see he was still going at it strong just before he passed. May he rest in peace. Now my sister and I have not let this encounter scare us out of the woods. Good for you. We still camp there to this day, but let me tell you, I sleep with a I sleep with a much bigger gun now. And a few years later, not too far from where there, I'd seen another Bigfoot crossing the road, but this time I knew exactly what I was seeing. The club and no return. Keep up the good work. Sorry if it was so long, Angela. Angela wasn't so long. I could have, if you kept writing, I would have kept reading. All right, no problem. It's, thank you for sending that in. And you got some guts on you. You got some guts on you, girl. Look at how many people see these things and they can't even look towards a direction where they saw it ever again. Get rid of all their outdoor shit and move to the city, right? Yeah, the butter, that reminds me of years ago in Pemberton, British Columbia, where I was recently living. One of the biggest, most intense Sasquatch hotspots on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. And talking to First Nations people there, and they're telling me about another woman in the community there who years ago used to have the butter stolen all the time. Butter she was making. They like butter. Man, it's freezing in here. I drove through two blizzards yesterday. What is it, April 9th? <clears throat> All right, here we go. Another one. Steve, my name is Wallace Miller. You may use my name. I'm a 76-year-old Vietnam-era Army veteran. I spent 20 months in various parts of Asia while in the Army in the late 60s. I'm now a retired part-time environmental engineering consultant. I'm writing you because your channel has caused me to want to tell others of events which took place in the woods of southeastern Ohio in 61, 62, and 1963. Back in the 60s, my friend's grandparents had an old cabin near Woodsfield, Ohio. Each summer, we spent a few weeks there hunting groundhogs and scouting deer. In the fall, we spent a week or more hunting deer in the same area. I was lucky enough to get a decent buck each year during that time, and so did my friend. What I want to tell you is not about Bigfoot sight. It's about what I felt each year during my serious deer scouting days. 
without exception, on each day that I scouted in a long, deep ravine along Wolf's Pen Road, I had an unshakable feeling of being watched. On windless days, in August for example, I swore I could also hear something pacing me as I quietly worked my way in and out of the ravine while scouting. I tried to be cagey and turned off and see what it was, but I never saw it. Several years ago, I asked my friend if he had ever experienced what I had way back then in that area. The question caused a long, awkward silence from my very articulate friend, followed by equally awkward, no, I don't think so. This was followed by an abrupt change of subject. Men of our age don't seem to want to talk about much things, about such things, but we should. By the way, my friend is a renowned special procedures physician. It was only a couple of years ago when I had retired and found your YouTube channel that I finally realized what was going on in the Wolf's Pen Ravine. I'm now certain that I had entered another being's territory. I'm also certain that the being was a Bigfoot, even though I never saw it. Thanks for providing the forum for us to better understand what is out there. I'm pretty sure others in my age group will recall similar experiences. Thanks, Wally Miller. Wally, thank you for sharing. And because it's men like you that make this people like you that make this page what it is, right? It's non-stop. How's my freezing cold copy doing? It's freezing cold. Mark, this is red. I'm gonna get one more up. I'm gonna go in, I gotta get coffee. Shit, I gotta get all that hay unloaded. Got the roof, gotta get the rest of my roof on. And I gotta stink, start thinking about my two day drive up north. Now, 60 years later, I know what it was. April 11th, 2022. Steve, my name is Wallace Miller. You may use my name. Oh. I just read that. How was that saved twice? There you go. I caught myself doing something stupid. Huh. Oops. Now you see how it happens. <laughs> Alright, how long is this one? This one's not too long. I'm going to squeeze this one more in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. A ton of questions. I've had a series of strange happenings going on since the 70s. I'm not sure if they're all what I call the visitors or not. As a Christian, I'm puzzled as to where such a creature would fit into the biblical narrative. I prayed, asking God what and why I feel. There are a couple of possible answers. I've watched way too many Bigfoot videos, but, I not, but I had not these events would stay filed away as unanswered, and they would not have been, and that would have been fine. But after hearing many accounts and then realizing so many strange events matched other people's stories, I have to say I'm quite certain some were the visitors. The first event took place in Michigan's Upper Peninsula in the June of 1969. My dad started fly fishing for big brown trout at night in Michigan's Upper Peninsula in the mid-60s. I joined him along with my two older brothers and a cousin a few years later. We would fish on a river that was designated a wilderness area. And we always hiked in a mile or two and fished from 8 till 9 p.m. until 1 or 2 a.m. Oh shit. On one such night at approximately midnight, I had something large walk through the brush across the river from me. I smelled it before I heard it. And my cousin that fished just upstream from me heard and smelled it also. And he said it must have been a bear. The next night I was in the same area and once again it came through walking across the stream from me just out of sight. I waded into the middle of the stream to avoid whatever it was of it shaken up. Then a few years later, we were fishing upstream from there about a mile or so, and my two brothers and I, as well as a friend, had come back to the vehicle about 1 a.m. We were standing outside overlooking the swampy area next to the river. My dad hadn't come back in from fishing yet, so we were waiting on him. We started to hear someone or something crashing the brush down in the swamp. We heard it coming from a couple hundred yards away, heading directly for us on the hill. We all thought it was my dad and figured he lost or forgot his flashlight and was stumbling through the brush. We walked to the hill's edge and all started yelling, Hey, Dad, up here! as we shined our flashlights down over the swampy area. The noises stopped and we continued to yell and shine our lights trying to locate my dad. Just then, one of us noticed a flashlight coming down 
a two track in the other direction. We could see the person had waders on and it was, and was carrying a fishing pole. We all ran to the vehicle and jumped in and flew down the two track to find my dad walking our way. We hustled him into the vehicle and then took off not saying a word about the noises we heard. A couple years later I was up the river again at night fishing by myself when a boat came down the river after dark also fly fishing. I didn't know people fly fishing at dark, it's crazy. I was pissed to let them know it because I know they were going to spook my fishing area. They passed by me, there were a couple of bends downstream from me, when I heard what I called a very loud beller, like a large bull would do, but a little higher pitched. I could hear the two people in the boat let out a couple of gasps and a few ex expletives, as well as the boat shaking violently from the being scared shitless. They didn't come back after that and I didn't have any idea what could have made the noise. I was just glad the boat never returned. There were times when fishing I would get that creepy feeling I was being watched or followed. But hey, it was dark and I had no reference and so loved fly fishing at night that I just blew it off as the jitters. Then a few years later I was up there again with my black lab as he loved coming with me trout fishing. I would spend the time hunting and checking everything out. One night I was woken up by my dog pressing up against me in the tent growling at something outside. I could hear someone walking around my campsite and thought maybe some locals had found me and were attempting to steal some of my equipment. I jumped up, shot out of the tent with my flashlight and club in hand to find nothing but total silence and my dog would not come out of the tent. From that time on my dog would not get more than a few feet away from me. Even when I was wading in the river he would just start to whine if I got close to the other side of the stream. I would have and would have to tell, sorry, and I would have to tell, t t sorry, holy shit, and I would have to let him swim across and join me. I never put any of these things in perspective until listening to other people's stories. I don't go out at night anymore by myself, and I also have cut back on hunting as well. I was wondering if you ever considered these beings descendants of Aso, Iso, the hairy hunter in scriptures. I've read about you considering them to be the fallen ones as well and possibly even a cross between men and beasts that are spoken of in the book of Enoch. Just trying to put some things to rest in my mind. Sorry for rambling, but who else can we share it with? No shit. Uh, I don't know, you know what? I'm freaking frozen. As I cruise along my ride, I, like I said earlier, like I said from day one, this is one of the easiest topics I can deliver to the world, we can deliver to the world to prove not honestly informed, right? And I do say that, so I think a lot of people don't quite pick up, excuse me, what I'm trying to get across when I say that. It's, you got to take note of what I'm saying, is one of the easiest topics, all right? So that should let you all know that I'm not stuck here just on these beings. That's, that was the door for me to open up, to search out and sift through all of the absolute bullshit we have been raised with and all the bullshit we've been manipulated with. Does it make me angry? Of course it makes me angry, especially today. Sorry, before I get off track. Do I think it may be of the hairy beast, the predator mentioned in scripture? Maybe. Um, it's tough for me to answer that right now, clearly, because um, the further I go, the more I learn, the more alarming our reality becomes to the things that I am learning. And I'm learning from the people I have completely shut off mainstream news, mainstream, mainstream news. I've shut it completely off out of my life for quite some time now. And um, I nonstop seek out information from the people, from independent journalists, from whistleblowers, from the people. Who else do you got? There's nobody else to look for for knowledge, right? So some of the recent knowledge I've come across, which will relate to your question about what I think these beings are, as mentioned in scripture, um, the knowledge that I'm gaining as of late, to be honest, uh, scares the shit out of me. It's sad, it's upsetting, it's alarming. 
makes me angry. Um, it makes me want to fight. Uh, I listen to, uh, oh, but getting back to what I was getting to, the, the more I learn, the more I see and listen, uh, I am about 99.9% .9 convinced right now that we are definitely, without a doubt, in a long going uh, possible, what you may maybe want to call it a religious war, maybe you want to call it a spiritual war. There is no doubt in my mind that good and evil are going at it right now. And from what I, the more I learn, the more I realize just how much evil has been somewhat winning for quite some time. And uh, it's very frustrating to become aware of. It's, it's very alarming to become aware of, right? But anyway, so we'll see. Time will tell. Um, if it is what is going on today is that classic, what we have, many of us have been somewhat told, that it's possibly a religious or a spiritual war, <clears throat> then it will definitely be leaning towards these beings. A fairly good chance that that is possibly what they are. Um, but we got to take in other information from all, we got to take in from the information from all the people we can, right? So, as well, recently we're still waiting on word on our other professional colleagues who are going to share with us what they found from over, from 3,000 DNA samples. And what they have said in confidence is, quote, someone or something intentionally messed with our DNA, with, messed with that DNA, that Sasquatch DNA, 3,000 samples, they said that, quote, 15,000 years ago, it is absolutely apparent that something messed with human DNA and crossed it with a handful of other alarming things, which we'll be sharing soon. So, <laughs> you take that into account, right? And then that gets a little nest in this part of your brain over here. And then you hear of the scriptures that I get emailed to me probably dozen times every few days. And then that sits over here in this little shelf in your brain. And you try to figure it out. And then in the meantime, you start listening to other people on other topics. Another one I'll pass on to you is recently I listened to a woman, Mel K. You go to Rumble and find her, Mel K. I find her very sincere, very intelligent. She's a freaking tiger. She's a lion. Thank God for her. And she spends her time outing the dark side. She recently did an interview with a woman called Nurse Erin. All right, now Nurse Erin, who is a nurse, she's been in, in Iraq, she's been all over the place, professional nurse, and she is a whistleblower, and she's blowing the lid off of the realities that have gone on in the hospitals when it comes to this nasty shit show called COVID-19. I strongly urge you to seek that out and listen to that. Uh, also, uh, a lot of people out there have been emailing me, dozens and dozens of people have been emailing me, e emailing me links to the new documentary release called Watch the Waters. And uh, just so you know, by the time you guys all email me, I've already been there, <laughs> all right? So, but I, it makes me very, very happy to see so many people. When I get those emails, it tells me that I'm not alone. There's shit piles of people out there trying to seek the truth and they're sharing it. Beautiful. And I would strongly urge all of you to go and, and find that one. Watch the waters and watch that one and take from it what you will or leave it. And um, it's pretty alarming shit up there. It makes you sad. What, what Nurse Aaron shared made me very sad and made me very angry. And maybe want to fight. I just want to, you know, I'll bite my lip on that. But anyway, so we'll see what happens. It's coming. As long as the people continue to stick together like they are here, as a one small example, um, we're going to it's, it's, we're going to become enlightened. We're going to learn more, and, and nothing but, nothing but good is going to come from what we're doing, right? As we uh, stumble along our rides, our rides of life. Man, I'm frozen. But anyway, I'm babbling. Gotta go get some more coffee, got some food in me, get it going. But anyway, in closing, um, 
and Nurse Aaron, Mel K, Rumble. And then after that, watch the waters. All right, and then take from it what you will or leave it. And also I want you to possibly just go on, go by your own intuition. Do not go by what people tell you, all right? When I was first trying to find more on this Nurse Aaron as an example of how the narrative is controlled, I went onto YouTube and I typed in Nurse Aaron and every time I did a search on YouTube, this prick, this filthy prick, this page would come up. I don't know if he is an actual doctor, he calls himself a doctor, I think he's got 400 and something thousand or 700 and something thousand subscribers, whatever it is. And the very first video when that comes up when I did a search for Nurse Aaron was this prick's channel and him tearing into her and trying to discredit her character. And uh, for me, using my own intuition, just look at his eyes. Eyes do not lie. Eyes do not lie. And uh, you can see this phony son of a bitch. You know, it's talking with those big wide eyes. And you know what? And the further you dig into this, this horrible person, she's an anti-vaxxer. And as soon as I see that delivery, I'm not even going to be shy about it. I want to seek him out and punch him in the mouth as hard as I could. There you go. So, why I'm mentioning that is, is do not listen to the people. As soon as you see someone attacking someone's character, instead of discussing the topic at hand, guilty. Kick them to the curb. That's just what I do. All right, I'm getting a little off topic. I'm starting to ramble. I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta get caught up. I've been sitting, for, I haven't sat here with you guys for a handful of days now, and I really get, need to get back into it, and I need, need to get caught up. I need to get all of you heard, all right? And this group needs to grow. I still have never ever said, you know, the usual bullshit that, that people online say that need subscribers and need the following, do this and do that, and be sure to do that. Stuff it. People who want to learn find places like this on their own. <clears throat> That's what's happening here. That attracts the correct people, right? People that want to help themselves and help each other and be honestly informed. That's what this places like this attract. 250,000 subscribers flipped a couple to few days ago. Crazy, isn't it? All right, that's enough babbling. My brain's starting to race. All these different topics go into my brain and just race around, and I want to scream out loud about all of them. Anyway, keep emailing me, all right? But in the meantime, I, I would hopefully encourage you to possibly give Nurse Erin a listen to, especially listen to her and watch her delivery, watch her eyeballs, listen to Mel K and her, have their interview on Mel K's channel on Rumble. All right, just give it a listen. It's harmless. Take from it what you will or leave it, but listen.